I would like Leonard to take over again, and I would like all the speakers who have been here to come up. Uh, those of you with headsets, keep them on. The rest of you, I have a microphone. Uh, but actually, Suna, I think you should sit down, because I would like to present our two of our evaluators, who are actually very, come on up, you can come on. I would like to invite uh, Alan Irwin and Kate Soper, who was kind enough to evaluate the Pufendorf Institute three years ago. And in this evaluation, they actually made a call for this conference. So now I would like to have them on board and, and join the crew here, please. So this time, um, it's now quarter to four. According to the program, we are supposed to finish by four. And I would like to, uh, uh, Eva, you said we can continue for a while, yes. but I would like to, uh, I think it's, it's a good manner to say that four o'clock is the official end point. So people are free to leave if they like. Don't feel sort of uh, embarrassed if you have to leave at four. Uh, but there will be a discussion going on if yes. there are questions yes. for some time. <clears throat> and as I said um, earlier, that this will be sort of a continuation of the discussion we had before, um, and this time we would concentrate on more administrative. Can I just shift now? Otherwise, everybody stands in the background. So. He looked very determined when he walked away, so probably there's something. Yeah, okay, yes. That's where we ended. So. Next slide, no? I'm trying to, oh, I, I have to uh, point at the uh, computer, is that right? No, it didn't help. Can I use the page up and page down? No, no, right now. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, okay, so from the scientific substance or obstacles to advanced interdisciplinarity, to administrative, if there are such. I'll start with this picture. Um, so it's about leadership. Uh, for those who don't speak Swedish, uh, it actually says um, life-threatening leader. Uh, it's, this is um, a vignette to this. Is the leadership of our academic institutions, are they life-threatening? Life is now sort of the science, it's not sort of the, the human lives. Um, this is an interesting uh, editorial. Some of you might have read it. It came in Nature uh, in 2007. Uh, they highlight this thing. There is a sense that the department-based structure of universities is essentially at odds with collaboration. So, so Nature is, is um, one of the really sort of pillars of hardcore science. They they have identified that, that this is a problem. Um, I have been very much inspired by um, a sociologist, Rogers Hollingsworth, some of you may know of him. He has studied scientific creativity for a long time, particularly in the biomedical fields or, or sort of in the life sciences. And he says that there is one institution in the world which is by far the most successful. When you, when you count in the number of, of, sort of citations and Nobel Prizes and all kinds of things. And that's Rockefeller University. And many people haven't heard of it. Uh, they wrote a book about, I think it was the 50-year anniversary or something like that, of, 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 of this institution. And it was a fantastic dis dis description of an uh, intellectual environment. They say, there are no, there are virtually no administration, there are no faculties, there are no departments, there are research groups that are very flexible. They, they live for some time and then they die. There's no democracy and things like that. So, so, so in, a, in a sense, you can, you can see that here is an extremely creative organization or sort of institution, but it works without um, administration. So my question to you now, I will have first a question. You're only allowed to answer yes, no, or don't know. So the question is the following. Is your university organized in the best possible way? <laughs> Start with Michael. Yes, no, or don't know. Don't 
don't know. Don't know. No. <laughs> okay. 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 So nobody said it's organized in the best possible way, at least. <laughs> and, and, and Alan even said it, there is no best way, perhaps. So my next question is, where you may actually be allowed to elaborate a little bit, is there a f an essential conflict between creativity and order? When I say order, that means a structured way of, of, of running departments and with... Uh, uh, sort of, yeah, all the administrative package that we have. Is there a f uh, an essentially a conflict between creativity and order? Start with Alan. Okay. Um, is there a conflict between creativity? I think um, you need both. Uh, I like um, Herbert Simon wrote a paper, the audience here, Herbert <laughs> Simon wrote a paper many years ago about the business school. Uh, just an example, but it's an interesting example. And he, call, and he called it mixing oil and water. So the idea was just like oil and water, they tend to separate if you just leave them. And I think it's kind of like that with the disciplines, on basically that they separate out. And the, Herbert Simon's point was you have to keep finding original ways of mixing these two things together. As soon as you stop making that effort, it settles back down into the familiar pattern. And I think the Pufendorf Institute is a very good example of mixing oil and water. You, you put energy in, you mix those things up, uh, and then uh, you have to keep finding new ways of doing that, otherwise the elements separate. So that's basically how I see it. It's not an end point, it's a constant mixing of these elements. Yeah. Kate. Um, well, I think I agree with quite a lot of what Alan said, um, and that on, I mean, if we're talking within any given subject area discipline, then I think you have both, you need a certain kind of order as well as creativity, and these need to be uh, both encouraged, I think. There is uh, famously no freedom, as it were, without, without some kind of regulation. If we're talking about the role of external institutional order as the encouragement or discouragement of creativity, then I think the issue is probably more complicated because obviously there could be more or less uh, constructive forms of ordering. And it seems to me I, one of the reasons I answered no, although a bit like Alan, I don't actually belong, properly speaking, any longer in a, in a university, um, <coughs> is that I think it's not so much the, the disorder or order that is created by the academic uh, departments and their relations, although that could be improved, but, this, the, but more the forms of ordering, which I find problematic these days, of a, a certain kind of ethos, which has become much more commercialized and vocationally uh, orchestrated in, uh, at, the, at the more administrative upper levels. So that would be my kind of answer, and I don't think that is encouraging the kind of creativity we need to solve our problems. I think I used this. Right? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I would just speculate that there's probably a middle range of structure, which is the sweet spot for creativity. I think complete freedom, even if it were possible, is a little bit um, unnerving, right? And so there needs to be enough structure that people feel comfortable with the expectations, but enough, enough space that they, they can move about uh, that structure. So, you know, I, 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 it's a matter of degree, of course. Isn't it fantastic? Here we have a group of non-Swedes, and they all promote logom, don't they? <laughs> logom. That means something in between. Mm. Not too much, not too little. That's very, very Swedish. I'm Swedish, so maybe that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Miles. Well, I don't have anything really to add to that, because okay. I think the intuitions are right. Okay, good. But I will make one thing, which is... Um, the balance at the policy level seems to be more towards this proposition that creativity is being fundamentally inhibited and that we need to wash away the current structures. I think it was Glee may have to say more about this, actually. So maybe I'll pass straight over to you and you can... <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't follow up on that, but, oh, okay. but generally uh, my, my answer is no. There's no conflict in the sense of a trade-off. More order, less creativity, less order, more creative creativity. 
uh, it's an optimization challenge, as it were. And I, I think that's another way of putting the same thing that, that these people already said. And, and I would even possibly make it more stronger. Uh, maybe there is a conceptual impossibility of creativity. The very concept of creativity would make no sense as a concept uh, without there being order. You have a microphone. Um, I think I will go back to an example of the NSF Science Technology Center that we spent the 10 years in uh, and the conditions for creativity that were created by that. Uh, we had a flat um, $4 million a year for 10 years, roughly, and then we brought in somewhere between another 50 and $100 million over that 10 years, so it was a very large project. And what, the, uh, what that $4 million a year did was not only seed grants, but it gave us a space, it's more like BioX, and um, an office staff. We actually had somebody who knew how to do all the paperwork on National Science Foundation grants and who could run offices, who could run educational programs. We had a mixing space. My graduate students were over in the engineering building with open desk space along with everyone else to work. Uh, when NSF came for site visits, they always interviewed the students separately with no faculty around to make sure, and that's how they knew if things were really working or not. And when the center ended, we were back to the same old, same old, is you can get grants to do your work, but you can't get that support structure, that infrastructure. So those conditions of that infrastructure, the BioX, the Science and Technology Center funding, that is really rare and precious and the best opportunities for interdisciplinary uh, work of, of my career. Thank you. I think I'm probably going to sound like an echo. I mean, I, yeah. think, I think creativity requires order, but not all order is conducive to creativity. So if uh, departmental leadership, for instance, don't work to create a, a safe environment for people to take risks, that's going to have a, a damping effect on creativity. If departments or other academic communities uh, engage in epistemic exclusion, where people are marginalized because of what they know or because of the kind of work they do, that can also have a real uh, limiting effect on uh, the, the kinds of personal risks you need to take in order to be creative, uh, in my view. Yeah. Um, no tension, and it's <laughs> already been explained why. So instead, I'll uh, comment on your way of phrasing it, because or it's very popular among academics to use the word administration to denote everything that's evil and restricts us and kills creativity, et cetera, et cetera. I think as academics, we need to realize that a university without administration is going to be as horrible and dysfunctional as a society without a state. Okay, so um, you all think that Rogers Hollingsworth was wrong when he depicted Rockefeller University as this enormous sort of uh, hotbed of creativity because they were so such a flat organization. A flat organization or, will or, also have an administration. Yeah. Or, uh, pardon? OK. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, next question and a short response because we also would like to invite the audience. Um, I think that Alan, you had a very sort of the most articulated response to this, oil and water. Um, and actually that can make a quite good dressing if you have sort of, yeah, yeah, the best sort of uh, vinegar and, and the best oil, yeah. Um, so can order and anarchy, in a sense, can they coexist? Can you have spaces in university where you allow sort of wild experimentation over extended periods? I'm not talking about um, these sort of ad hoc short things, like Pufendorf, a theme in Pufendorf is perhaps this kind of wild um, experimental thing, but it's for 
one academic year, but can you have sort of more, more long-lasting areas within the university where you allow more anarchy, and then you have the departments that, that um, uh, we heard about, they are sort of the bear, they, they, they are accumulate the knowledge and they're responsible for passing the knowledge on to the next generation and so forth. So that's where you have the order. Yeah, I, I think actually, I think it was Michael, there were so many people made points, but I thought Michael said it well about um, how institutions can kill creativity, you know, and, and if you think about interdisciplinarity and you think about where it's really important, I mean, early career researchers, you know, doing the things we're talking about, and getting excited about it. I think it's extremely important that institutions find a way of valuing and rewarding people who take those risks early in their careers rather than late in their careers. Those of us who are professors um, have the comfort, et cetera. But it's really important how institutions care for and develop their early career researchers in particular. So that's a great example. And I see many kind of dark clouds around that one, uh, particularly when I look across to the UK, of ways in which um, the reward structures, the appointment processes, the journal impact factors, and those kind of things might actually be killing interdisciplinarity among that early career group. So I think we have a responsibility to talk about that and how we make sure that interdisciplinarity can develop through this next generation of talented researchers uh, and actually be positively valued by the institution. I, so that's my concern about institutions killing these kind of ideas. Not all of them, but it's there. Yeah. Um, well, I, can anarchy coexist with order uh, in... I suppose the short answer is yes, at least if you mean by anarchy, blue skies thinking, or very um, yeah, risky forms of of research project and here I think um, I am persuaded in saying yes in part by the Pufendorf Institute itself because one of the things that it certainly does is represent, I wouldn't exactly call it anarchy but certainly some of the most um, you know, innovative and exciting spaces have opened up I think as a result of their particular no model kind of approach to, to doing interdisciplinary research but um, I, like Alan, share quite a lot of, um, I mean, I'm not encouraged in thinking that this is going to be generalised uh, elsewhere at the moment. And I think if, uh, you know, the anarchy in terms of literally allowing uh, every possible form of research to flourish is not at all what is going to be encouraged at the moment. And that is part because of the way in which corporate funding is so very often tied to what is possible and they have their own agendas and so on. So literal, hmm. literal anything goes research is not going to be on, I don't think, more generally. Certainly not in the UK, where I come from. Anybody else? We don't have to go sort of... Uh, uh, in the correct order. So we, we can be a bit uh, disordered. I'd, yeah, like uh, I'd like to hear from the audience. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, Uskali first. And then... Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm all in favour of anarchy. I mean, these, these uh, small islands... Of Pardon, you said you're not or you're off. I am, I'm all in favour. Yeah, okay. All in favour, uh, but these small islands here and there, unconstrained, adventurous research, encouraged, in, enabled, etc., but no age discri discrimination. I, I, I think it would actually be these late career uh, scholars who would be best fit for that. I mean, they already have developed a, an open mind and, uh, and sense of relativity and things like that. Prone to horizons. Uh, they might be more prone to these adventures and taking in contact with, taking contact with uh, other disciplines. Okay, it looks like you and Alan need to uh, have, a, have, a, have a talk about that. Uh, so, uh, any, any, any comments and inputs from, from the audience? Yes. So, Maya Host, I'm a professor of science communication at the University of Copenhagen. And I also, I'm also serving as head of the department, which is really a school because it's a big place. And I'm also on the Research and Innovation Policy Council that advises the Danish minister. And sorry for all of that, but it has it bears on what I'm going to say because I would like to... No, first I want to say something else. I don't think it has anything to do with age. I agree with Ellen that, that some of the young people risk getting trapped because they're not secure enough when they start doing... And I think that there's some wonderful 
very experienced researchers who are very open and who are exactly the right people to send out on these things. But then I also have some, I know some <laughs> colleagues who are exactly on the opposite. Sort of. So I don't think we can sort of age thing this. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to suggest was I was actually a bit uh, surprised uh, about this sort of thinking that there's all these things that stop interdisciplinary spaces. And that might be true, but in this uh, council, we're currently having, we're discussing uh, research careers. And it's extremely obvious that generally industry is so much better at appreciating interdisciplinary competences. And actually, it's not just interdisciplinary. It's the ability to go across borders, and that goes with disciplines, it goes with lots of other things, then we are in the universities. And some of us have begun to think that actually universities might risk losing all the best and brightest because they go to industry where some of these boundary-spanning competences are much more appreciated and that we actually really need them some of them, to stay in the universities. And you mean they go to industry not because of the salaries is higher, no. but it's actually more no, interesting yeah. uh, environment. Okay. They, get, they get better jobs where their qualities and competences are valued better. And these are not people that are motivated by salaries. They're motivated mm -hmm. about their, by their work conditions. So it's just to say, I agree that it's important that we create spaces, but I actually also think that universities are sleeping and they run the risk <laughs> of losing the best ones. Any comments or, or new questions or new comments from the audience? We have a bit of anarchy here. Every, anybody is actually allowed to say something or comment on something that has already been said. Yeah, I'm Per Riot again. Uh, well, I don't think there is. Uh, uh, yeah, well, there is conflict between order and creativity, <clears throat> but order is not very interesting. I mean, people are telling us all the time that to think outside the box, and if we all stay inside our boxes all the time, nothing will happen. So, and it's um, we have to have flexibility. We have to accommodate the outliers because that's, that's where the new and interesting ideas are born, I, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's... So the problem might be that the box has there's always been boxes, but the boxes are becoming sort of more sturdy. They are very hard to go outside, perhaps. Yeah, that's one pro problem. Yeah, yeah. We have... Um, what we call mainstream science in, in many areas. And, and uh, it's very difficult to, to make a career out, outside the, the ma mainstream. So that's, that's too, too much order in, in those disciplines, I think. Would anybody comment on that? If not, I would like to explain this figure a little bit. Um, because that relates to a final question that I would like to, to pose here, and, and if people can have a very, very, uh, very swift answer. It is um, a curve taken from a paper by Hollingsworth, uh, Hage and Hollingsworth, a strategy for the analysis of idea innovation networks and institutions uh, from 2000. And they, they summarize, uh, Rogers Hollingsworth summarizes the best or the most creative institution or organization of a research group is one where you maximize cognitive distance, scientific diversity, and communication among actors. So this is supposed to represent where most of the major biomedical breakthroughs, they happen in organization where they maximize the scientific diversity and the communication among the actors. Many universities, he claims, they are trying to either create very large institutions for economies of scale, which are so large that the communication breaks down. There's too much of diversity, and the communication breaks down because they don't understand each other. Or they try to create very, very focused research group where everybody has a fantastic communication, but everybody's talking about the same thing, and there is 
they are not very creative. And then he said, this is sort of based upon empirical work within the biomedical sciences. But he said, there is nothing that prevents this from being some kind of universal, universally um, applicable rule. And when I pushed him a little bit further, he said, yeah, this organization is probably at least 25 people, probably less than 45. Uh, because you can't have just too few and sort of a few outliers. You need to have a critical mass of all the all the sort of the diversity to to have this 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 uh, sort of um, creative ongoing uh, communication. So, how many of our departments follow this model? Do you have one? Well, <laughs> I, I just want to say that. I mean, it, I guess maybe I don't understand it, but it, the worry I have is that if you take this to be a norm, right, that this is something you should strive for, then folks like me, I'm a humanist, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, any, any kind of uh, uh, collaboration I enter into with a scientist is going to push us way to the right, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, in terms of cognitive distance between a humanist and a scientist, or right? So that suggests, at least, uh, the, wor the worry I would have is that that if you took this to be the norm, then that would uh, provide reason to not collaborate with me, and I, that would make me very unhappy. Um, okay. So yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it may be harder, right? And mm -hmm. it, it's certainly harder, probably, to, to take those dots over on the right and pull them up. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Alan. I was um, a very interested once I was speaking to Michael Crow, who is the uh, very charismatic president of Arizona State University. And I mean, they're doing a lot of interesting work on interdisciplinarity. I mean, his idea, his vision of the university is a very, of ASU, is a very interdisciplinary institution. And of course, some people like that and some people don't. But the point that Michael Crow was making was, why do universities all across the world want to replicate Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Lund for that matter? I mean, his point wasn't to criticize those institutions, but to say, pretty obviously, in the big planet that we have, we need a diversity of universities and a diversity of institutions. So for me, it isn't about any individual institution. I mean, good luck to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and Lund, you know, if what they're doing is worthwhile and exciting and important. But it's, we shouldn't all be the same. So what actually perturbs me is the kind of isomorphism, to use another mm -hmm. organizational studies word, that you see across institutions. Because it does seem like there is a kind of conformity across institutions. Why aren't we seeing? You would think if you came from Mars that universities would be the place where people were constantly playing with this and experimenting and just having fun with different organizational structures. But it seems like you have a lot of congruence. And that's the bit. It's not the individual environment. It's how do we get the range of environments so we don't all just set up what works very well in Stanford but might not work very well in Copenhagen, for example. We should be just playing with these things and doing them differently. That, that's basically our yeah. But what happens to our ranking if, yeah. if they can't compare us? Yeah. And then it's about <laughs> your willingness to take risks. Yeah. And you yeah. can argue that you know, if you just try to replicate another institution, you're always going to come second. You're never going to win if you just copy. Mm -hmm. But that's a difficult lesson for university presidents to learn because the pressure is on them. It's not, the, 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 it's not to say they're dumb people, but the pressure on them is to conform with other places mm -hmm. rather than to take a different path. Research funding is the god, and that drives. <laughs> basically whatever administrators think is, is necessary that they need to do to get their universities in shape to, of course, get that money, then that will drive policy. And, of course, now there is a, a trend to have more interdisciplinary, more directed interdisciplinarity funding, and that is affecting how managers think about how to organise universities um, in not necessarily very reflective ways, but they, they again, following the funding. But it's not clear to me that that's yet working in the way it's, it's supposed to work. And there is one kind of reason for that, and that is that grant funding is still determined by disciplinary people. Mm. It's always on these committees, it's the disciplinary people that decide who's gonna get the, who's gonna get the funding. And that really does stifle interdisciplinary mm. innovation, because it has to look safe from a disciplinary perspective mm -hmm. before it goes, it goes through. Mm. 
And that's, that's an outstanding problem before I think we can deal with any of those issues about university structure. Yeah. Leonard? While they talk, I'm looking for okay. hands, so, so don't okay. be shy. Yes? A response Hello. to that? On what drives university structures? Which is back to the bibliometrics point. Uh, mm -hmm. the bit, you know, as long as we're looking at impact factors, H indexes, and so on, that very much drives disciplinary silos. I mean, people at some universities are being given lists of journals in which they are supposed to publish. And those lists of journals are produced by certain very large players who want to maintain their primacy. Uh, which works against open science, open scholarship, open access publishing, other than paying 5,000 euros to get one article, uh, one article open. So there's been a real push to, you know, to flip the journals. If you can flip the journals, if you can get your editorial board to leave um, any of the, you know, you know who they are, several large uh, publishers, and move to an open access platform run by Lund University, then you still got the sophistication of the people on the board, but you can begin to control the editorial process, and you can open it up more, and you can get other kinds of voices in here. So I think we need to be very um, aware of the kinds of publishing models and metrics, and people game metrics. Whenever there's a single number, people will game it. And it's not being gamed in favor of interdisciplinarity at all. Thanks. Oscar Lee. Well, this is a direct uh, response to yeah. your question about, about this figure. Are our, you said, are our departments organized in this way? Uh, this is a word of, uh, word of warning against generalizing too far. Mm -hmm. I mean, think, okay. Think of my favorite example of archaeology. Mm -hmm. Say, within an archaeology department, we have, <coughs> might have an, say, cultural anthropologist speculating theoretically about the past uh, commu cultural communities. And then we have an osteoarchaeologist, a bone chemist. And, and so there's a great deal of diversity there. And they only communicate at one time, you know, when the uh, chemist has made a major discovery that would constrain those theoretical speculation. Of the, of the archaeologist. So there's some communication, but not, not too much. I mean, how does that fit in this? Uh, yeah. I mean, that might be a major breakthrough or, or not, whatever. Think of a biology department. It's very dispersed discipline. I mean, fragmented in so many ways. And those people, so a lot of scientific diversity, hardly any communication between those uh, specializations. Uh, yet major breakthroughs happen uh, all the time. It's, uh, you simply can't generalize. I mean, it's so many different kinds of cases. Yes, but his point is the really, really innovative ones, they are organized in a way which is different from the mainstream ones. So you said biology department, they organize in a particular way. But I suppose it's fair to say that not all biology departments in the world are well, sort of leading. Um, time is flying. Um, so I would just like to finish and, and ask if you have one advice or suggestion to the new director of the Pilfendorf Institute for the next three years. It got a bit quick. Yes, go ahead. Develop your own publication series of journals and uh, journals and book series that is open to everyone and is based here on open access platform. One of our books is just over there. You're welcome okay. to pick one up when you leave. Thank you. It's, of course. Any else? Uh, Anyone pu else? Publicize the methodology. I mean, this needs to be spread more widely. We need to talk about interdisciplinary methodology. Say it one more time. Research-based leadership. And re this research would be on interdisciplinarity. A philosopher, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually really like the structure. I think I, I'm excited to see how it unfolds. I think that sticking with the structure and, and 
just paying attention to how productive it is over time. I mean, so Dr. Zare's uh, presentation really emphasized what you can learn about something if you let it grow and pay attention to the metrics. And I think this is really exciting and um, over time could really generate similar numbers maybe. Yeah, I endorse that, and I think you know, thou art to continue, as the character in Shakespeare says. Um, but just to add, maybe, I, as someone coming from the humanities, would like to see perhaps more develop across the science humanities and science and uh, humanities and social science, science barriers as well. Yeah. I think. Um, be prepared to boast more would be my question. I mean, tell the world uh, more. So, yeah, be less modest would be uh, my advice to you. I know you'll find that difficult to take, but I just want to say, it. anyway, here, here. you should be here, very here. proud. Thank you. Yeah. So, no more advice. No. Uh, hand over have, the word to you. Do you have a closing word, or that was the closing word? I hand over the, yeah. the closing words to you. Yes, and um, thank you, Leonard, for the uh, provocative discussion. And uh, thanks to the panel and your uh, presentations today. Uh, I will not say many, many, many words because we will meet for dinner. And uh, I would just like to, uh, if there is somebody still here that will not join the uh, conference dinner, I would just like to thank you for your participation today. <laughs>